guys, um, welcome back to the channel. Right, second of what I'm going to call Social History Sunday. Um, last week we talked about English surnames. This week we've got a little bit of a, a sort of a, mish, a, mismash, a mishmash of subject matter. All connected and with a central theme and which covers legend, industry and euphemism. Um, all to do with English culture. Right, so first things first, the legend, Robin Hood. We've all heard the stories, we all know the stories, um, we've all seen the films and what have you. Uh, my own personal, which I would, th personal favourite film, which I would thoroughly recommend, and I know lots of people who think it is one of the best retellings of the story, and one of the most accurate retellings of the original story, is um, Robin and Marion from the 90, I think it's 1974, could be wrong about that, but the 1970s starring, starring Sean Connery and Audrey Hepburn. If you get a chance to watch it, please do. Brilliant film. Uh, right, okay, so uh, again, my other favourite is Walt Disney, Walt Disney's Robin Hood. So, Robin Hood. Now, the earliest retelling we have of Robin Hood is from 1520. One, twenty-two, I think, by the Scots cleric John Mayer. Um, he was a cleric, a historian, and a writer. And he wrote. He wrote. He was a, his is the first written telling of the story that we know of. And in that, he describes Robin Hood's band of merry men as being dressed primarily in the Lincoln green. Um, apart from Will Scarlet. Now, I don't know whether he mentions Will Scarlet in that telling, um, but Will Scarlet is in the later legends as the guy who wears red. He's called Will Scarlet because he wears scarlet red. Now, this is where the industry part of it comes in. I mean, we're not retelling the legend of Robin Hood. We're just using this as an in a segue into the industry part of the story. Um, now, Lincoln Green and Lincoln Scarlet, as it was originally known, are two colours which were licensed for exclusive use by the clothes dyers of Lincoln. Really clever people. Up until then, cloth clothing fabric could be dyed a sort of red colour, but it was a more of a, a dark pink. Um, or a, a brownie colour. The dyers of Lincoln managed to produce a really, really strong scarlet red. Um, and they also produced Lincoln Green. Now they were really good because they could actually, they developed a process where they could, where they could over dye fabric in a way that hadn't been done before. For instance, there were other other um, dyers around the country who could dye green, could make green. But they did it by either mixing yellow and blue dyes together and then dyeing the fabric. Or they dyed the fabric yellow and put a light blue dye over the top of that. The Lincoln dye, dye makers did it the other way around. They developed a process where they could put the darkest colour on first, they put the blue on first and then over dyed with the yellow to create a really strong, almost emerald green colour, which was known as Lincoln Green. And they were the only ones licensed to produce it exclusively. I mean, there were other cities that had exclusive colours, um, and just about every city in the country had some kind of cloth dyeing industry going on. And they could produce whatever colours they liked, except the ones that were licensed to other cities. For instance, um, Norwich had a license to produce yellow and it was a particularly strong yellow um, which only they were allowed to produce. Uh, I mean other, other cities could produce other variations of the yellow but um, Norwich yellow was the only one they could produce and even to this day Norwich still associates itself with yellow. I mean they actually call their football team the Canaries which okay is a 16th century import in the country, but it was they adopted the canary as their mascot, as their symbol, because it was yellow. 
um, Coventry. This, I, mean, I don't know whether you've heard the saying true blue. Well, if something is described as being true blue, it's be, it is basically perfect and clear and absolutely spot on and can't be changed and it's, it's as good as it's going to get. Well, that saying comes from the Coventry dye industry where they produced true blue fabrics that were dyed in true blue and they were any every bit as good as the famed French blues um, that were produced on the continent at the same time. The difference being most of the French fabrics were cottons. Most of the English fabrics were wool. I mean we produced some really really fine wool but it was wool nonetheless um, and Coventry produced some really fantastic blues. So that's the industry side of it. Um, is there anything else I want to mention about that? Um, not really. Oh, there, there's, there's a couple of like other little bits and pieces come in, like the Plantagenet, the royal family, the Plantagenets, um, from Henry the First onwards up until I think I uh, can't remember the last Plantagenet king, one of the Edwards. Anyway, um, covered quite a period. Well, there's an anecdotal story that goes with that uh, Plantagenet. Supposedly, the, there's one meaning that says lover of flowers um, and it's associated with yellow flowers from the genet plant. Now, there's another story that says that plantagenet is actually a compression of, this, of the, the phrase plant a genet. Plantagenet, plant a genet. Now, it's supposedly Henry II loved Genet and planted it everywhere he goes. Now another name for that is broom. It produces a really brilliant yellow flower and it's also known as dyer's broom. And supposedly the reason why um, there's so much, there was so much broom available in England for the dyers to use to produce these fantastic yellow dyes, for instance in Norwich, is because everywhere he went, apparently, Henry II planted broom or genus. I don't know if that's true. I've heard it from a few sources. But I think that's quite interesting. So there we have the the legend and the industry side. So let's get to the fun bit, the euphemism side. Now, in medieval dyeing, and even to, well, even in dyeing processes, you need your dye, your fabric, the dye, and you need a fixative. A mordant. That's what a mordant is. That's what they were called. It's basically a fixative. Now some dyes need quite strong fixatives and in fact some dyes can't be made unless you have a really strong mordant in which to dissolve the dye. For instance the blooms that were produced in Coventry uh, were made from the wood plant which it grows all over the UK, um, especially in Scotland. That's what the Picts, the Scottish Picts used to do, use to create their war paint. Now, wood, which produces indigo, indigo is not soluble in its raw form in water. Um, the only other way to dissolve it in the 12th, 13th century would be to use in alcohol. Now, English people being English people, they're not going to waste alcohol making fabric dye. Better things to do with alcohol. So what they discovered was that you could use urine. And if you concentrated it by boiling it, you actually produced quite a strong fixative and solvent for indigo dyes, especially. Um, but it works with us, and it became a really, this is how the um, Lincoln dye makers were, man were able to dye, to over dye colours because the, the mordant, the fixative they made with urine was so strong, it was, inc it was incredibly strong fixative. Um, but the only way to make it is with the urine from piss. Now how do you go about collecting sufficient quantities of urine to satisfy the needs of a countrywide industry? You could try collecting it from cows and horses and things like that, but that's going to be fun. So what a lot of cities did is they collected human urine, piss basically. Um, for instance, Lincoln, they actually bought urine by the gallon from 
the citizens of the city. So basically, at the end of the week, you could uh, you could collect your piss up during the day. And well, every time you had a pee, collect it in the bucket or whatever, and then take it down to the um, the dyeing workshops, and you could actually sell your piss to the dyers. And a lot of people sub a lot of people subsidise their income by selling their urine. In other places, um, it was collected through barter, so you could actually trade foodstuffs and services for urine. Um, one particular story that I really like comes from Coventry, where they really did need quite a lot because they were producing a lot of blue cloth. So what they did is they entered into a partnership with the city's pubs, the public houses, and basically they put buckets outside the front doors of the public houses or pubs and the drinkers, when they needed to relieve themselves, would actually go out the front of the pub and they would piss in the buckets. Um, now the dyeing companies paid a, a sort of a dividend to the pubs who did this, who allowed this to be done, which I think was probably most of the, the pubs in Coventry um, allowed this to be done. I'm sure it was Coventry. Begins with the city, begins with the sea. Anyway, so they allowed this to happen. So um, they basically paid a license fee to the pubs and then overnight they would collect the piss. Now it's also suggested that some of the pubs would actually discount or give you a credit against a drink when they saw you go outside and have a pee in a bucket. Maybe give you your next drink half price, that sort of thing. So this is where we get the euphemism in England. If you ask somebody what are you doing tonight? And they say, oh, I'm going out on the piss. Or I'm going to go and get pissed. That's where the youth, that's where, what it means. That's where it comes from. Because in the 12th, 13th, 14th century, they were, it, it was described as going on the piss, was to go out and have enough to drink that you needed to have a pee, and you would piss in a bucket outside the pub. So you were going to get pissed. You were going on the piss. Now in America, I know... Um, you guys, if you say you're getting pissed, you basically mean you're getting angry. So we wouldn't say that in the, in England. We'd say we're getting pissed off. To say you're getting pissed means you're getting drunk. And that, so there we go. That's first euphemism. The second euphemism that I'm going to tell you about, um, evolving piss, urine, comes from my neck of the woods, about 45 miles further north of where I am now, from Tyne and Weir. Now Tyne and Weir is a, an area covering two rivers, the Tyne and the Weir, and two cities, Newcastle and Sunderland. And there's a couple of towns in between, but basically. And they had actually quite a thriving cloth, man, cloth dyeing um, the, the, the industry going as well. But they produced so much of the urine based mordant that they actually developed another industry and exported it to Scandinavia and to the Baltic, the Baltic states. And basically what they did, it was classed as a sort of ballast cargo. Now what that means is if you've got a ship and there's no trade going, you don't want it sitting in the, in, at the docks, tied up, doing nothing. So you take on a ballast, um, a ballast cargo and basically you just it's whatever you can get a hold of and you would take that away and you'd either trade it and sell it in another port and try and get something of better value to bring back. You get the idea. Well basically this is where we get the phrase taking the piss. Now if you say to an English person or a British person right, are you taking the piss? It basically means that you're accusing them of making fun of you in a not very nice, well originally, a not very nice, derisory, almost bullying, teasing manner. Um, you're taking the piss, aren't you? Um, so like basically, you're making fun of them for whatever reason. And the phrase comes from the fact that these ships that took on ballast cargoes of the urine-based mordant for trading with Scandinavian countries because they couldn't find any other cargo at the time, began to smell of urine quite strongly um, because the, the barrels leaked. But after a, after a while, 
it got to the point where they couldn't take anything else because the ship smelled so badly and they couldn't take passengers and they couldn't take they couldn't take foodstuffs because the ship smelled so, of, of urine so much they basically stunk of piss so you would have the sailors on the docks the, the, the crewmen for these ships and people would ask them oh, which ship are you sailing on and their answer would be that one over there ah oh, you're taking the piss aren't you can't do any better than to take the piss you can't get a better job on a better ship to do something better than taking the piss so basically if you were accusing somebody of taking the piss it comes from the fact that these poor guys who started off working on these ships that might have been hauling perfectly normal cargo they do three four five ballast cargoes of urine and the ship starts to stink and all they can do so people would tease them about not being fit to serve on any other ship than a piss taking ship they were taking the piss anyway so hope you found that interesting um, I don't know what the next subject would be if you've got an idea jot it down in the comments below and we shall see what we get um, other than that thanks for watching stay safe keep slinging the sticks we'll talk again soon Cheers, guys.